Welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. I'm John Jessup and I have the privilege of co-hosting the show with Ashley for the next two weeks. And today, June 19th, is America's 12th federal holiday. Juneteenth is an annual celebration of the emancipation of black Americans from slavery. It's a day to enjoy family, friends, and food. It's also a time to reflect on the history of this holiday and what it can teach us as a country about healing race relations. Brody Carter brings us the story. The origins of Juneteenth date back to the Civil War, where some 750,000 soldiers died, either fighting for freedom or to preserve the institution of slavery. And Juneteenth was just the beginning of progress. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. We learn about the civil rights movement, but it gets reduced to Rosa Parks and the I Have a Dream speech and maybe the Civil Rights Act. And that's almost the basic idea that most people have around U.S. racial history. New York Times bestselling author and Christian thinker Dr. Jamar Tisby says some of the most important race-related events have been omitted from American history, like Juneteenth. Most history books don't even mention the name, which is why he's on a mission, re-educating the public about the day freedom finally came to all Americans. It represents the day, June 19th, 1865, when enslaved people in Texas first learned of their emancipation. Major General Gordon Granger of the Union Army came to Texas and he issued General Order Number 3. And in that, he said, all enslaved people in Texas are free. At that time, Texas was the farthest state west and the last to hear of freedom, more than two years after President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. As news spread, the shock for the some 250,000 enslaved Texans quickly turned to celebration. So as black people celebrated their own emancipation in the United States, they looked to the Bible and the Old Testament as inspiration, as, as biblical justification and continuity between the liberation they experienced and then the liberation uh, that was spoken of in the Bible. Juneteenth combines the words June and 19th, but according to Tisby, it was originally referred to as Jubilee Day, a biblical reference to Leviticus 25, celebrating the Israelites' freedom from slavery in Egypt. Faith formed the foundation of what would become America's most recent federal holiday. Yet the freedom given to black Americans would become overshadowed and even replaced with the rise of race-based segregation known as the Jim Crow laws. Dr. Cassandra Newby-Alexander, professor of history at Norfolk State University says, Juneteenth commemorations went underground as the Jim Crow era ruled for nearly a century. However, black Americans saw incredible progress from the Civil Rights Act in 64, the Voting Rights Act in 65, and the Fair Housing Act in 68, and yet black people were still facing an uphill battle in this nation. Why are black people and other people of color still experiencing discrimination and inequality after the gains of the Civil Rights Movement? <laughs> As society, including historians, politicians, and religious leaders, seek to address the unanswered questions about race still lingering today, Dr. Tisby believes the church has an opportunity to lead and be an example in the 21st century. I think the church could make incredible progress if we understand that racism is both individual and institutional. It's both interpersonal and systemic. We need to both change hearts and change policies. I think that's really the challenge for the church around race today. Dr. Tisby offers some concrete ways the church can be a guiding light in this fight for racial justice. First, by being aware of injustice. Second, by building community relationships with schools, organizations, churches, and people who are different from yourself. And thirdly, making a commitment to find solutions to problems that still plague people of color to this day, all based on the biblical mandate to love your neighbor as yourself. Brody Carter, CBN News. Joining us now is Dr. Jamar Tisby. Jamar, welcome to the show. Uh, Juneteenth started off as Jubilee Day. Many people may not be aware that there is a biblical connection. Can you talk about how the Bible plays a role in the early days? 
a lot of black people were people of faith and Christians in particular. So of course they would look to the Bible to help them navigate life in general and this peculiar institution of race-based chattel slavery. They look particularly to the Old Testament books like the Exodus and the literal emancipation of enslaved Hebrews from Egypt. And they also looked at other texts in the Old Testament, like uh, the celebration of Jubilee. This was a periodic season where debts would be forgiven and slave people would be set free. And it was almost like a social and economic reset. And so they applied that to their situation in slavery in the United States and looked forward to a day of Jubilee when they would celebrate emancipation from race-based chattel slavery. So you talk about the celebrations. I understand they primarily happened in the church. Can you tell us more about that? When you think about the 19th century on into the early 20th century, really, the primary gathering place, the, the space that Black people could really call their own more than any other was the church. Churches were places of affirmation, community organizing, education. And so when any significant event happened, whether that was a wedding or a funeral, or of course, events like emancipation and looking forward to emancipation, they would gather at the church. And the church was the site of celebration. The church was the site of protest and organizing. And then as emancipation approached, we got to remember Emancipation was announced in September of 1862. It didn't go into effect until January 1st, 1863. So that few months between September and January was a really anxious time for Black people. They weren't sure if the proclamation would be rescinded, if there was going to be some compromise, if freedom would actually come. And so on the night of December 31st, which of course is New Year's Eve, it was watch night for black Christians. They would gather in the church and they literally counted down the hours until the clock rolled from December 31st, 1862 to January 1st, 1863. And the Emancipation Proclamation would actually go into effect. And they did this at churches. And when it happened that first year in 1863, there was jubilee, there was celebration, there was rock and partying in the streets to celebrate their freedom. You know, as a kid, I remember going to watch night services, going into New Year's Eve, into New Year's, and uh, you can see where that, that tradition comes from. Uh, I want to ask, why do you think it's so important that we as a nation recognize Juneteenth today? There are few events in U.S. history that come even close to the significance of the elimination of race-based chattel slavery. So purely from a historical standpoint, this is one of the seminal events in the history of our country. And of course, we should commemorate that, not just occasionally, but annually. Of course, we know the Emancipation Proclamation didn't actually free all enslaved people. It was limited to uh, Confederate states that hadn't been taken under union control, and it left slavery in border states like Delaware and Maryland and others untouched. But it signaled that the Civil War had transitioned from a war to preserve the Union to a war to truly eliminate race-based chattel slavery. So I think we should remember this because on the one hand, we should never forget that for centuries, race-based chattel slavery was the law of the land, and it ruined the lives of millions of enslaved people and their descendants, the effects of which we are still grappling with today. On the other side, we should celebrate Juneteenth as a as an acknowledgement of progress, that change can happen, that something as deeply embedded as slavery in our country could actually be eliminated through the concerted, ongoing and resilient efforts of people advocating for freedom. You know, it is significant that Juneteenth has become the 12th federal holiday. I, I wanna ask you uh, before our time runs up, what do you think we can do moving forward as a nation, but also as individuals to help bring racial reconciliation to our communities, especially as Christians? So we've gotta be very careful that Juneteenth remains a specific commemoration 
of emancipation from race-based chattel slavery, by which I mean we need to make sure that we don't forget the history and the origins of this holiday. It's, it's a Black-centered holiday, and for a long time before it became a national holiday, Black people celebrated it. So we don't need to, to have this holiday um, become diluted by trying to add a whole bunch of other things. So, so things that we can do as individuals, go back and read um, the, the general or announcement number three uh, that was actually read in Galveston June 19th uh, in 1865. Mm. Go back and read that document. Another thing we can do is donate to Black-led or Black-centered organizations. Uh, it could be your favorite museum. It could be a nonprofit, but financially supporting these organizations. Right. The other thing we have to do is remember that there's a legacy of slavery. And I would look particularly at things like the racial wealth gap, as well as um, mass incarceration and the way we treat uh, incarcerated individuals in our nation. Mm. Dr. Tisby, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Ashley, what's next? Racism, it's ugly, it's divisive, and it's destructive. When we stop and listen to our black brothers and sisters, we can begin to understand the pain they've endured. So what is the responsibility of the church in the fight for racial equality? Take a look. It's so complicated um, breaking racism down, but the solutions to racism are not complicated at all. People make it complicated. Racism, for a lot of people, in their minds, they think it's burning crosses in yards, calling someone the N-word and wearing a white hood somewhere. It's not as overt, <laughs> very much uh, covert. So when you call it out, people think you're being sensitive. You're a good one. You're a smart one. You're articulate. Um, and I am. And so you always have to question, is it by comparison to something else? I just want to be seen the way that, that Jesus sees me, um, as his creation, as his uh, son, um, as one of his own. God's love is for all. We are all God's children, that Jesus died for all of us. He didn't discriminate when he decided to take his last breath on the cross and take the weight of the world on his shoulders. Because a certain people group don't experience this system, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It went from slavery to Jim Crow. We had civil rights, just new Jim Crow. It just keeps changing and evolving into something else to keep oppressing people. We can talk about redlining, gentrification, mass incarceration. We can talk about, uh, I mean, just we, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. When I learned the non-watered down version of our history, and it's a kick in the face. You can't have this much tension, this much hatred, and it not be a spiritual thing. When the enemy sees racism, he sees his work in progress. He doesn't want the kingdom of God to thrive, and racism, unfortunately, has been one of the ways, uh, one of the most prevalent ways uh, that he has been able to make headway in making sure that the kingdom of God does not thrive. Race has this incredible power to divide us all up. Particularly to divide the church. To infiltrate the church and do so in such a way that it has marred our witness, it has marred our reflection of our great, good, and just king. I think Jesus is grieving over racism. What does the kingdom of God look like? It looks like love. It looks like justice. It, it, it looks like empathy. It, it looks like unity. It looks like peace. If we are not doing our part as Christians to dismantle and destroy the evil of racism, we are talking and not walking. If you bring the same passion and excitement that you have for Jesus Christ, to tearing down racism, racist beliefs, racist actions that you see around you, this world will be undone. 
All right. Well, joining us now to continue this powerful discussion about Juneteenth, racism, and the church are pastors Dan Backens and Kevin Turpin from New Life Church right here in Hampton Roads. Pastor Dan, Pastor Kevin, thank you so much for being with us today. It's great to be here. Well, we wanted to talk to you guys because New Life Church is a multi-ethnic church. When you go to the website, I mean, that's one of the first things in the about section. That's something that you guys are very proud of because it took some work to get there. Can you just tell us why you wanted to, to create and, and uh, develop a church that was multi-ethnic and why it's so important? Whoever wants to answer first. <laughs> oh, well, Pastor Kevin and I met at Regia University. I came from a predominantly white background and not almost exclusive. Kevin came from African American church. He's from New York, I'm from South Dakota. And we met in a class became friends, and over coffee, over time, we talked about, you know, why is the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday yeah. the most segregated hour of the week? Mm -hmm. And I think our friendship was a launching pot, a pad to some discussions, mm -hmm. which led to creating uh, a passion for trying to do something that's not easily done, and that is a church that's intentionally multi-ethnic that would reflect heaven on earth. Well, how have you guys been able to intentionally do that? I mean, obviously, it took some work, right? What kind of work was that? Pastor Kevin, can you tell us about that? We were very intentional in making sure that the staff, the leaders, the pastors, support staff uh, was diverse. Mm. Uh, that was the first thing that we did. We knew if we were going to be effective or successful at this, that when individuals came into the church, uh, at some point, they needed to see someone in leadership on the platform. Mm -hmm. So we were very, very meticulous in praying through, uh, Lord, who might you bring to mm -hmm. the church that we would uh, bring on staff that could help us move the multi-ethnic vision mm -hmm. along. Well, Pastor Dan, you mentioned the most segregated hour in America is Sunday morning. Right. Why do you think that is? Well, first of all, it's not unique to America. Mm. In every culture, people are attracted to people like themselves. Yeah. Whether it language, culture, skin color, ethnicity, country of origin. And it's that need for comfort, that need for something that they recognize, the need for a place where they can exhale, causes people to congregate around people that are similar to themselves. And to be a multi-ethnic church, you have to go contrary to a very strong sociological impulse. And that is the impulse, I want to be safe. Wow. Because you're in a multi-ethnic church, you don't feel safe because you're not sure of culture and context and if I'm going to be interpreted right or misinterpreted. And that's why it's the natural flow of things. Look who's, you know, just look at who's at your birthday parties. Mm. Look, look who's in your families. Look at what neighborhoods we live in. We have a tendency to go places where we feel safe. Yeah. In, in, essentially, you know, preferences, that's very strong. And in a church in particular, um, you, you have a preference in terms of worship a preference mm. in terms of uh, preaching style, yeah. a preference in terms of the length of the service. These were all the things or challenges that we had to take into account. And folks typically like to be in a place where, and as I said, particularly on a Sunday morning yeah. or weekend, <clears throat> when it comes to the church, you know, they, you know, they, they, if, if they enjoy choirs, they, they want a choir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Certain type of singing, <clears throat> you know, that, mm -hmm. that's what they want. And I, I will say, as, as somebody who has attended New Life for a few months now, I appreciate the multi, it's, it's visible, like it is true. It is a multi-ethnic church. So I just wanted to give you guys kudos and I know that you'll give glory to, the God, to God too. So thank you. And I do notice that there is different styles of preaching. There's different styles of music. Easter, you guys had a choir and it was amazing. It was powerful. Um, but a lot of people assume that the, the issue of racism is a political issue. It can only be solved through policy or politicians. But we know as Christians that this is a kingdom issue. This is a spiritual battle that we can overcome only by the spirit of God and the love of Christ. Um, can you just talk about that? Yes. First of all, I'd like to say that there are there is a need for political mm -hmm. uh, solutions, but it's, it's in terms of order. Mm. It, it can't be the first order of business and the first effort. And I believe that's where the church has a unique role. It's a spiritual problem. It's sin. 
It's in the heart of every man and every woman. It's not unique to one group of people. And it takes the Holy Spirit to uncover that and it takes the Holy Spirit to address it, to sanctify it. And so therefore, I think the church has the, it should be the leading edge of, of demonstrating, pro, proclaiming, explaining, being patient um, with the whole need for multi-ethnicity, anti-racism, multiculturalism. And then the political solutions can come out of that, but it mm -hmm. certainly can't be led by that. Yeah, it starts in us first, right? Yes, absolutely. As, as, as Dan said, it is a hard issue. Uh, and we see it even in the, in the first church mm -hmm. in Antioch, you know, which was a diverse church. Uh, we see it when uh, Paul chided Peter. <laughs> you know, so it's not new. Yeah. Uh, it, it existed from the beginning of time. But we first must recognize, and, and it is the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, as we allow them to, to convict our hearts because it's something that can be very subtle. Mm -hmm. And I think the average person will deny, no, that's not my problem. Wow. However, um, there are situations, there, there are circumstances in life that will cause it to raise its ugly head. And it's so vitally important that you recognize it for being what it is. Or that's when you're in a diverse congregation, you're able to interface mm -hmm. with others who can perhaps shine their light on that blind spot. All of us have blind spots. Yeah. And it, within a multi-ethnic work, at least, you could talk to folks who are different, have different perspectives, different views, and can share things that perhaps you've never heard before that might challenge you. And that's on all ends. I don't care what race, what ethnicity you are. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, talk about how some of the some of the things that New Life has done and continues to do to be proactive in um, just bringing racial reconciliation, not just within your body, but also in the surrounding communities and some of the things that you've come up against, how you were able to overcome that. All right. Well, um, you know, as a church, we've we, were, we tried to respond proactively with like the George Floyd mm -hmm. uh, situation and not be in denial, and, but also not to overreact to one way or the other. So to preach, to teach, to model um, biblical messages that are contextual to what's going on in our community. And then beyond that, there are things like seminars, there are things like writing, there's things on the website. It's part of our core DNA at New Life to be multi-ethnic. And part of that mission is to help others in this fight against racism. And it's huge. But it's it's adopting a community we are in. Kevin, how many schools are Life Richmond Center in? Uh, 25. There are schools. 25 schools. We have another program that's in three other elementary schools mm -hmm. trying to do our part in, in uh, this fight against racism. And so it's a whole community effort. Yeah, definitely. Pastor Kevin, um, what word of encouragement would you give to other church leaders, I mean, nationwide, worldwide, who want to do what New Life is doing but might not know where to start? What word of encouragement would you give them? Obviously, just the heart. Uh, obviously, even for myself, um, John 17, I believe, is 21, the priestly prayer that Jesus prayed, Lord, make us one, that the world would know that you sent mm -hmm. me. And first, it has to start in that pastor's heart. Mm. You know, it can't be something that's novel and it's nice. It's going to be a way we're going to grow the church. There has to be a conviction. Uh, there has to be a sense of an assignment. And that's important, the sense of an assignment that this, this is right, this is biblical, which it is. And then from there, as you open your heart, the, the Holy Spirit does the rest in terms of bringing those that you're going to need around you. And in some cases, you have to be very intentional in going outside of your comfort zone mm -hmm. to expose yourself uh, to other uh, church leaders who are not like yourself so you can hear, so you can uh, actually observe what they're doing and so you can grow as yeah. well. Uh, so it's not something that's just going to happen just because, you know, you, you're saying, okay, this is a good thing. You have to pay a price. There's a price to yeah. be paid for it. But there's also a grace that comes with it to Amen. follow it through. Amen. Last question. It's really not a question, but maybe it is. Pastor Dan, Pastor Kevin, what are, what are your prayers for the future of the church with this specific um, topic of racism and reconciliation? Right. My prayer for the church would be meet this hour without fear. Mm. Meet this hour without being passive, pessimistic. Nothing can change. 
realize that um, the power of the gospel can change the hearts and the institutions of our, of our world. So my word would be uh, rise up in hope, get on the team, do your part, don't fall back into despair, and uh, have the idea of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen to that. Anything you want to I would add? say in terms of the multi-ethnic church, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's the work of the Spirit. Amen. You know, in all of our planning, and all of our desires, it took the Holy Spirit. It took lots of prayer, and it continues to take lots of prayer. Mm -hmm. And it takes the Holy Spirit to do the work. He just is looking for a willing heart. So if you're open to the Holy Spirit and you petition him concerning, Lord, um, knowing that in this hour that we're living in, where there's so much division, what is my role as a leader? What is my role as a pastor? And I believe if we're sincere, the Holy Spirit will do the rest. The Holy Spirit will guide. He will open up opportunities for you to grow in the area. And if you step out and you want to diversify and you want to experience something new, um, Trust me, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen, <laughs> By guys. By the work of the Spirit. Yes, yes. I wish we had more time. Thank you guys so much for just chatting with me today. Honestly, God bless you guys and everything that you're doing with New Life and Beyond. And I just want to leave you guys with these words from Galatians 3:28. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. God bless you guys. We love you. We'll see you next time. Hey everyone, I'm Ashley Key. Thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so we can reach more people with encouraging content like you just watched and so you never miss a beat. See you next time and God bless.